Welcome back to 10-Minute Prophecy, where we go through the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation in bite-sized chunks. We hope that this journey through Bible prophecy has been enlightening, whether you are new to prophecy or have studied it in the past. As always, if you haven't seen the previous presentations, please watch them as each prophecy builds on the previous one. We are going to continue with Daniel 11. We hope that you are excited to continue on this journey and see how God predicted world events precisely and accurately. So we are now coming to the conclusion of Daniel 11. In this last section, we are going to discuss the rise of the papacy and the fall of atheism, along with the final events before Jesus is coming. So last time we left off at verse 40, and we'll now continue on in verse 41. We encourage you to read the verses with your Bible. Verse 41 says, He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Prophecy says that once the papacy regains political power, it will overthrow many. The word countries here is a supplied word indicated in your Bible in italics. The prophecy also mentions the papacy entering the glorious land. Some believe this refers to literal Israel, but just as the identity of the king of the south changed with the time of the end, the meaning of the glorious land has also changed. It no longer refers to Israel. We know this from the 70-week prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, which marked Israel's probation period. When the leaders of Israel stoned Stephen in AD 34, it fulfilled the 490-year probation, signaling that Israel was no longer the glorious land or God's chosen nation. This is confirmed by Acts chapter 7 and verse 55, where Stephen sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God, symbolizing judgment on Israel and the end of its probation. Since then, the glorious land has become anyone who accepts the salvation Jesus offers, as described in John chapter 3 and verse 16. Israel is now spiritual, and God's people are found in all nations who believe in Jesus. The papacy is prophesied to enter the glorious land, which represents Christ's followers who reject papal doctrines, and many will be overthrown. The word enter here implies conquest. As some Protestant churches drift from God's word and move toward theology and worship that emphasize emotional experiences, entertainment and cultural trends, they become vulnerable to this conquest. This type of worship prioritizes entertainment over the word of God and aligns with Satan's strategy. Satan's strategy has three key principles which are the foundation of Satanism. First, I can be a god unto myself by making my own rules. This is the idea where people create their own rules, elevating themselves above God's authority. Second, I find my own truth. This is your own subjective truth, seen in phrases like, live your truth. This makes you the source of all truth and denies that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. Third, follow your heart. This says that your heart is the foundation of your life rather than God's word. These ideas are widespread in both children's and adult entertainment. Any philosophy promoting these ideas is not from God. In Revelation, we will see three divine messages that directly counter these three satanic principles. As these false ideas infiltrate the church, we see the growing alliance between some church organizations and the papacy, signaling the prophecy's gradual fulfillment. As we approach Christ's return, the papacy will regain state power and try to impose control over God's people through a state-mandated form of worship known as the abomination of desolation, which involves placing something unholy on what is holy. We will explore this further. Additionally, the prophecy introduces three powers, Edom, Moab and Ammon, that escape papal domination. Historically, Moab and Ammon were descendants of Lot, while Edom descended from Esau, Jacob's twin. These nations, relatives of Israel, symbolize those who will hear God's message and join his people before Jesus returns. Now verse 42 states this, 
He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Here it talks about the conquest of the papacy, which stretches forth his hand upon the countries. This represents the exercise of its state powers. So what is the land of Egypt? In the first 30 verses, it was the territory of the king of the south. Then in verse 40, the king of the south, as we found out through history, is atheism. So the land of Egypt here is referring to the territories of atheism. As we found out last time, atheism produces communism. So part of this has already been fulfilled in the fall of communist Soviet Union, who now professes Eastern Orthodoxy. What is left is China and North Korea, as well as other communist countries who will eventually fall to the power of the papacy. So all the world will follow. We see this happening today as the Pope is the most respected person in the world and has much influence. Now verse 43 shows more. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also, the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. Here, the Bible prophesies the papacy's control over global finances, facilitated by a union between church and state. This state power alliance grants the papacy significant influence through military, political and religious power. The Book of Revelation provides specific identifying traits of this state power, which we'll explore further in Revelation. Additionally, the text mentions the Libyans, located east of Egypt, and the Ethiopians, which is west of Egypt. Who do they represent? Looking back at the Battle of Actium, where Caesar represented the King of the North, and Mark Antony and Cleopatra represented the King of the South, we see that the Egyptians' last line of defence included both Libyans and Ethiopians. These two nations historically gave support to Egypt. So, who gives support today to atheistic powers? We find that historically the Islamic nations provided alliances with the Soviet Union and vice versa. In fact, we see that Russia today still supports the Islamic powers in the Middle East due to this legacy. In the United States, we see the atheistic movement, which one of the resulting ideologies is the woke ideology, supporting Palestine and Islamic groups. We can see that Islam is not the king of the south, but it is a geopolitical ally of the king of the south, which is atheism or secularism. Just a reminder, the Bible always symbolizes world powers so that it is obvious. The world powers that stuck to atheism or secularism are communism, and the supporting power is Islam. The only power to challenge the United States, a Christian power, is communism, which is an atheistic power, and also Islam. So we see this contest today. In the future, we will see that once the papacy gets the church and state union, the fight against atheism or secularism and Islam will be won. The battle will not be won until there is a church and state union of the papacy. Now in verse 44, something interesting occurs. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. After gaining global influence, the papacy, which the Bible prophesies, will again have power over the world through its church and state union, receives alarming news. This isn't a kingdom or a political power, but a message referred to in the original text as tidings from the east and north. What is this message? The Bible gives us clues. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 2 refers to a prophecy about Christ who comes from the east. And Isaiah chapter 43 verse 5 speaks of the Lord gathering his people from east to west. This confirms that the message is from the Lord and it will infuriate the papacy, leading them to act with destructive force as the Bible predicts. So what is this message? It is found in Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 to 9, which is an expansion of verses from Daniel. We will explore the details when we reach Revelation. But who will the papacy target? Those who deliver this message, the faithful followers of God living out his truth. God steps in after the papacy has seemingly conquered the world, reminding them that he is still the true king. In the eyes of the world, the papacy, referred to as the king of the north, may appear victorious, 
but in God's eyes its sins have reached heaven, signalling the end. The phrase he will go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate refers to the death decree that the papal authority will proclaim. Now in our last verse of 45, the Bible says this, And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Here we see that the papal power planting something between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. What is it that he plants? Tabernacles refer to religion, and palace refers to political or state power. Notice that the tabernacles is plural. This refers to the religious philosophies of the papacy. Palace refers to the state power of the papacy. So this power will plant a religious state law in the midst of the people in the holy mountain. What does the seas represent in Bible prophecy? We find in Revelation chapter 17 verse 15 that it represents people. What does the glorious holy mountain represent? Psalm chapter 48 verses 1 and 2 says that it is where God's people are. Joel chapter 2 verse 32 states that deliverance comes from Mount Zion, which is the holy mountain. Now before this in verse 31, it states that the sun will not show its light and the moon will turn to blood, just like in Revelation chapter 6. So the papacy plants a doctrine in the middle of the people in the holy mountain. What is this law? As we know from the previous verse that the papacy goes out to kill, and this planting in the midst of the people in the holy mountain can only mean that it is the death decree against God's people for not agreeing with the papal mandate. But notice when this occurs, the Bible states that he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Notice that his end happens after he plants the death decree against God's people. Something interesting to note is that if you compare the two verses, you find that God sends a message in the previous verse and the papacy sends a message of death to God's people in the last verse. The Bible then says, his end comes. Well, what happens next? Find out in chapter 12, where we see Michael stand up. That concludes our time together. Thank you for joining us. We hope you have enjoyed this nugget of prophecy. Join us next time as we continue more exciting revelations in Daniel chapter 12. We will be starting Revelation soon. You will be amazed at how Revelation magnifies the prophecies of Daniel and really give even more detail to all of the prophecies we have just studied. Don't hesitate to go back through the videos if you need a review. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below and don't forget to like and subscribe. We look forward to seeing you again soon.